Hello, everyone. My guest today is Jimmy Kin. He's a digital marketer turned tech founder, built a platform in 2013 to solve his own problems, which eventually turned into a business in 2015. That business, folks, is called SendLane.com. He's living it up in sunny San Diego, California. Jimmy Kim, you ready to take us to the top? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me back. Thanks for coming back on. It's been, um, gosh, 18 or so months. What For those that missed the first episode, quickly, what's SendLane do? Uh, we're email marketing for e-commerce. Yeah, okay, that's different than last time. So you, you are now hyper specialized in e-commerce. Tell me about that decision to go sort of niche. Correct, correct. So in uh, 2019, we kind of looked back at all our data. We surveyed our customers, looked at all the data around like, you know, LTV, ARPU, and just kind of really figuring out what our customers are really like and what looked like the good longevity for the future. And uh, we made a big decision in 2019 to rebuild a platform, which we'll call V3 now, that's now live. Uh, last, in 2019, it went live and hyper-focused and hyper-specialized on e-commerce on really deep data and like how we can take someone to the next level beyond name and email. What did you feel was broken where you felt like you had to make that choice? You know, you did an analysis and you said, we have to specialize in a niche, let's go e-commerce. But but what was broken that made you do the analysis in the first place? Sure. I think I think the top level is very easy to find a customers. Let's just start at the customer level. What we were serving before, like a lot more of the content creator space, it was just a more difficult market to find. And we found that the, the size of these customers tended to be much smaller. So you would have to get more velocity under your belt in order to do it. And they turned a lot faster because a lot of them were just starting businesses. They were a little bit more uh, immature as a business as well, too, a lot of times. And, you know, there was mature businesses as well, too, but a lot more on the lower end side of things as well, too. So that's kind of how it all started for us, kind of starting to figure out that our customer side of things weren't uh, weren't exactly a fit for what we wanted to do for our future. I see. We're recording this down here on September 15th. Give us an update revenue wise. What did you do in August in total revenue? Uh, we crossed a little bit over uh, $420,000. roughly, And that's pure SaaS? Uh, pure SaaS, correct. Intr- wow. Okay. So that's great growth because when you came back on in November of 2017, you were just flirting with $150,000 a month. So you've almost 3X'd uh, over, call it 29-ish months. Nice growth there. Have you bootstrapped or did you raise? Uh, we did raise in uh, December of 2018. We actually raised some money uh, then as well. So we raised $3 million. Okay. That, and, and that was equity or debt? Uh, equity. Okay, it was equity. Have you used any debt to drive the business growth as well or no? Yeah, actually, we actually use debt to, uh, you know, we've uh, been with Lighter Capital a couple times now with a couple different tranches, actually, uh, just as recent, recently as the company kind of exploded this year, a lot of our growth happened in 2020 this year. And uh, as the company exploded, we took on a little bit more debt just to continue to capitalize and keep lots of money in the bank. Uh, a lot of SaaS founders don't understand what it means to take debt as a SaaS founder. Can you sort of educate them at a high level sort of why you did it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's very simple. There's two things that come into place. One, the time frame, right? Like going to raise money takes forever. Doing debt can take five, seven days, right? That's the number one. And number two is I feel like people take uh, give away equity too easy and too fast. Uh, It's worth a lot more money than the little bit of money that they're giving you today for the future of the company growth. So for me, I'd like to hold back only on big milestones and when we really need to. And I think that's where we think about debt a little bit more. And I I look at it as if I have a plan that I can take that money and make more money than I'm paying on interest rate, then it's worthwhile that way. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's much smarter in that way because Secondarily, you don't have anyone extra telling you what to do with that money or you don't have people also looking at uh, that money and trying to figure out exactly how you're spending that and to let you kind of keep control as well, too. How do your equity holders, your equity investors, I believe they were Zing Capital, how do they feel about debt? Uh, They're okay with it. They understand the need and use for it. And they understand that as long as we're taking it and using smartly uh, and, you know, using it for reason, then they're okay with that as well, too. I mean, they offer to follow on, but we actually held off on that for the reason that we'd rather hold equity. And if we go to another round in the future, then we'd rather be able to kind of come in that clean. Yeah. So, I mean, if you go do another round in the future, how do you as a CEO and with your leadership team decide, do we go and do a debt round or do we do go, go raise equity? I think it's all goal orientated, right? Where was their goals? How is their profitability numbers? Where are we kind of flirting with? What what do we want to get into? And how do we want to spend that money, right? So, you know, if I wanted to go buy a bunch of companies and start acquiring for companies, then I'd probably go take a raise out, right? Because that makes sense. But if I'm looking to grow the company and start adding headcount, I think it's much easier to take in 500, uh, $500,000 or something like that and 
be able to kind of float the growth and get you there. And I actually like the pressure too of not having too much money in the bank. I definitely learned a little bit of a lesson with uh, my last raise where, you know, when you take in a lot of money as being a bootstrap founder and taking in some money, it definitely tried to, that pressure of trying to grow, get starts putting pushed on you when you have the money, it makes it easier to do that. But ultimately, if you don't hit the right levers, then you auto, you become, you go back to square one really quite quickly too yeah. as well. Now this is debt. I mean, you have to pay it back, right? So, so to your point, you have to be smart about where you're investing the dollars because you've got to get a return. Right. Help founders understand if they're thinking about taking debt. I mean, what, how are they going to pay it back over what period of time? What's the cost of the, of the capital typically? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, for us uh, with uh, with lighter than we worked with them, it's a three year term, right? It's revenue based. So it's based on your revenue and it's tiered buckets based around your revenue. And it, depending on how much you're making, they're taking a percentage up to about nine percent or eight and a half percent of that revenue per month. And then coming down from that, obviously, as you hit milestones. But uh, essentially, you just got to plan better and make sure that you're bringing the cash flow in on top of it and knowing that you have to kind of look at like, how much does that money go as far as paying back the debt and when the money needs to be coming back in? So you got to be looking at the long scope of the picture of your customers. So if you spend 500 grand here, you've got to make sure that you've recovered your 500 grand and start making money with it down the line as well, too. So, you know, we got you got to have to think long term, but you also have to have a plan for it. And there's a lot of sort of revenue based financing options in the space. Letter capital is obviously one of the larger ones. Uh, help people understand how much like how many months you said three years. 8.5% to 9%, et cetera. But there's also usually a repayment cap. So if you take 500K, you got to pay back some multiple of that. Can you explain how that works? Yeah, absolutely. It's obviously, it's kind of, I mean, it's it's a, uh, I think for us, it's like a 1.3x roughly. So essentially over a three-year term, we're going to pay 1.3 times more than we take, took in as money. Uh, and it's essentially just spread out over that revenue. So the good thing about revenue-based financing that I like is if you do have a rough month because maybe you're heavy on the front end of the month, uh, front end of the year or the back end of the year with your revenue, it allows you to kind of float that money a bit. Obviously, there's a catch-up period if it becomes a problem, but they're basing it off of your current revenues, which makes it obviously if you're growing, you should be able to achieve and grow past that really quickly as well too. Got it. So just to make that really clear, if you raise 500K from one of these RBF firms today and you have a 1.3x repayment uh, cap, basically that means you're going to be paying like $650,000 over Correct. whatever the term is, three years, based off 8 to 9% of your monthly recurring revenue. Correct. Okay, Jimmy, let's hard hard turn here. Let's go to product. Senlin, yeah. what, what have you released over the past three years? Oh, man, uh, a lot. Uh we released our V3 platform, which was the whole hyper focused on e-commerce. Then we started going really deep into e-commerce. So instead of going wide, where a lot of our competitors are, you know, trying to add a lot of little communication platforms and do things, we went really deep into email. Just my love of email and just being an email marketing ex expert myself, I could see so many use cases to really drive revenue at the deepest level. So you know, everything we do is very behavioral, data driven, and uh, allowing the allowing the merchant to be able to make these decisions and kind of drive everyone down a true personalized experience. Experience. So, uh, you know, we take like, for example, you integrate to Shopify right now and you get 100 points of data on the customer instantly. You can live segment it right on our platform and really drive a true behavior based around the information that they've given you location to revenue to what they purchased, what category down to, you know, if it was shipped or not. I mean, we, we cover all sorts of different points. Interesting. And how many customers are using the tool now? Uh, we have about 1,650 customers, roughly. 1650. Okay. So that's very different from 2017. You said you had about 6,500 customers. And so it sounds right. like you've let a bunch churn, but the ones that are paying today pay more. Yes, absolutely. So they're paying about 255 bucks, roughly uh, a customer. Now uh, we were probably, uh, I think on the last uh, one was what, 25 or $30, probably 24, 25 around there. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So you've 10 X changed. You've 10 X the average AC, the, the average ACV. Yeah. Interesting. And okay, so we understand sort of the capital stack. We understand how you've driven customers. You you last won the show in 2017, but when did you launch the company? Uh, so we launched the company in 2015, January 2015, technically. But for real, well, when I jumped into the company fully hands on, when I exited my other two companies, was August of 2017. Okay, August 2017. And how many people do you now have on the team? Uh, we have 38 people now. 38. Okay. And what? How many engineers? Uh, nine. Nine engineers. Okay. And any quota carrying sales reps? Uh, well, we just started ramping right now, but we had two as of last month. And now we're at seven as of this month with the VP of sales as well, too. So break that down. The first sales hire and especially scaling those early SDRs, those early AEs are, is not easy. You have to you know, put a quota in place and you're kind of guessing early on. How'd you make that first quota guess? 
Let, let me, let me, I'll back up and tell you a story real quick. My okay. first sales team completely failed. All right. And what I talk about that is I did launch a sales team. I hired people. I thought like I could bring in the big uh, logo guy and the VP guy and like really scale this team. And he'd go off and he or she would go off and hire their team and we'd get it going. And then, you know, my quota was based around because that first, before I hired that first salesperson, it was all me, right? I was selling everything. So I assume if I could do this, then 50% is what I would assume a, qu a quota should be for a salesperson as they're coming to the company. Well, a lot of the processes, a lot of the things were broken through that. And we ended up having a big layoff of the entire sales team in 2019. And we realized, and I realized that, hey, look, we didn't have a good repeatable foundation and process in place. And I realized that that was the problem to begin with. So I actually buckled down from uh, September of last year and essentially became the salesperson with one other guy. And we repeated the process and nailed down everything from cadences to uh, how the process works to how do we find people? How do we outreach to people? And we really laid it down over the last like 10, 11 months. And then we, when we got to a good process, we hired another salesperson. I think in uh, March, March, April of last, this past year, this year. And we basically repeated that process, made sure that he could carry it, get to his numbers. And then we were starting to grow our sales team right away. So then I went out and found a great VP of sales with tons of experience under his belt, five exits and all that good stuff and brought someone into the team. And now we're now we're at a point of scaling. And, you know, it's been just a different journey for uh, per se. And I, I kicked myself because I wish I would have figured that out before a year ago. And I would have saved probably half a million dollars of burn that I spent, uh, you know, trying to grow that sales team and losing it. After you let that first sales team go and you buckled down with one other person on your team, you said you wanted to make sure he could run a repeatable process and quote, hit his numbers. What was the target? How much new MRR did you want him adding per month? Sure. Uh, his MRR was uh, right, roughly $4,000. That's what he needed to hit. Okay. Interesting. And, and sort of get me in your brain there. Why 4000 4000 came out to 567000 in AR this in a year, right? And we, we kind of backed out all the data and realized that based around our metrics, where the company was, where our average revenue, where our CAC was, we knew that that is where they needed to be in order to kind of maintain profitability over uh, about an eight month period to start seeing the payback fully reoccur in the company as well, too. So we started to kind of understand the metrics and data. So I got into velocity. I got into a little bit of everything in order to make sure. So I got really deep into the sales playbook in the world. So 4K quota per month for one sales rep, if they do that back to back for 12 months, they've essentially added 50,000 in new monthly recurring revenue to the business or 600,000 in new ARR. Do you follow a traditional commission structure? You pay out about 30%? Uh, we pay out a little bit more uh, on, the, on the commission structure, we pay about 40 actually. So we go a little bit more aggressive on it just because the, the volume, it's a velocity game a little bit more for us. So when you have velocity, you know, you want to keep them entertained, especially if they're bringing in deals that are, you know, $500. I feel like giving them that little bit extra bump makes them feel a little bit stronger about, you know, their success as well, too. So and I want everyone to crush my quota, too, by the way. So these quotas are like, I mean, my, my reps are crushing my quota, which is a good thing. Right. How many of your seven quota carrying reps will beat quota in September of 2020 here? Uh, probably two, considering I've only have uh, the five of them are brand new as of oh, okay. days or less. So only two will probably hit it, but those two are the guys that have had and they will crush the quota. And how so, long will it take the five to ramp up to where they're beating uh, quota? How many? What we saw about three, four months. Okay, not bad. And when you say 40% commission, if I am your one of your new sales reps and I close 4K in new MRR, you are saying that I'll get $1,800, about 40% that month. How long will I get that 40% commission on those new accounts I brought in? It's just, well, it depends. So it's monthly or annual, right? So if they get monthly deals, then we pay out full there. And then annual, they get a percentage of the chunk. They get a little bit less. They get 5% chunk of the annual payment. So if they come in monthly, they get 40% of the first month's payment. And if they bring them annually, they get 5% of the entire annual chunk. Oh, I see. So they really, you sort of, every sales rep starts from clean every month. They're not sort of building a commission stream over time. Correct. I mean, they've got the sales cycles and everything else going, but it's a very black and white commission stream right now. Yeah. I mean, the nice thing about that is that it's simple. I imagine you must get a little pushback though from sales reps going, I'd love to get commissions longer than just the first month. Yeah. Well, the, the point is to push into an annual deal. <laughs> and get 5%. Correct. Of the yeah. annual pay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, interesting. Okay. And, and so let's go through your funnel for a second. So I'm on sure. the site. I click request a demo. You ask for first name, last name, phone number, et cetera, about how many people are filling out this demo request, you know, whatever, to, over a day or a week or a month, whatever time period you want to uh, use. We're, we're bringing in currently inbound about, uh, about 300 qualified uh, leads from our website, uh, or, uh, from our website through corporate and internal onboarding demos. So either through there, or if they sign up for a trial and they go ahead and 
fill out all the right markers, it gets over to their sales team and then our sales team reaches out. And over what period of time? Uh, 24 hours. I mean, Oh, daily. So daily you get 300. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 not daily. Monthly 300 roughly. Got it. Got it. Okay. Per month. Got it. And so how many, you have nine, you now have seven sales sort of quota carrying reps. How many demos are they doing per month? Uh, our goal is to get to one demo per month for each of them. Again, because a lot of them are new right now, they haven't gotten there obviously right now. So we haven't gotten there, but the goal is not per month, one demo per day per business day. So 20 demos a month is their goal. Okay. Got it. So 20 demos per day. And then you're help. You're hoping that they close how many of those? Uh, we've been on pace right now. We're closing 60% of our demos. So when we get on a demo, uh, we'll close at 60%. Okay, got it. So if they're going to close 12 accounts at an average ACV of salt, call it like 200 bucks a month, right? They need to either do more than 12 accounts or sell at a higher price point than 200 to hit that 4,000 right. quota. Correct. The sales team right now is running about $8,600 ACV right now on their closed deals. On average? On average, correct. Interesting. And how many are they usually up front? Uh, no, uh, 20% are up front right now and the other 80% are monthly still. So okay. something That's we're working still, on shifting at. That's still healthy. I mean, $8,600 average ACV on these closed accounts is, what is that, 700 bucks a month on average? I mean, that's, that's, that can grow quickly. Um, interesting. Very cool. What else should we know about the business that I haven't already asked about? Uh, nothing really. I think uh, some of the things that we've really just been focusing on in the company, I think last year's kind of pain exposed a lot of things. And we, we've got our churn control. We've got, you know. Which churn? Our, uh, churn. So two sectors. I like to be, uh, you know, overall, look, I'll do two, two ways, uh, overall churn, entire company running about 4% uh, on the revenue churn, about 8% on the logo side on overall company. But if we hone down on the revenue where the sales team's operating, which is what we call our pro or enterprise level, uh, we're turning about 17% annually on that. And we're doing net positive retention. So we're doing about 105% net positive retention on there. So our revenue churn is not there. It's just all logo churn on that side. Interesting. So on that cohort that you do, you do have touch on there as a demo, you have, you clearly have expansion revenue to get above hundred percent net revenue retention. What are you typically upselling? Oh, we're not upselling. It's natural growth. So it's all subscriber or contact count. So based around contact ah. count growing any good business that we bring in that grows, will naturally be able to expand over time. Yeah, you've got a really nice um, sort of contact calculator on your pricing page where if they go from, you know, 25,000 contacts to 50,000 contacts, they can sort of move the thing and see what the change in price point is. Yep, exactly. Do you like this model in terms of pricing or would you make any changes? You know, it's simple. I, a lot of our a lot of our competitors will have that model plus a CPM model plus this model and they'll start adding a lot. And I understand the business side, but we find that customers just get irritated by most of them. Half the times the customers do come to us like when we take we started recently taking a lot more on the higher end. So like the Oracle Brontos, the, uh, you know, the dot digitals, list, list track type users. That's literally their pain point that they get frustrated about because they paid this huge chunk of money and they have these CPMs and these caps and they end up feeling really limited on that side. And for us, we own our own infrastructure, so we don't care. It doesn't actually cost us more money to send more emails out outside of simple server usage. Mm -hmm. So we kind of set back and said, you know what, we're going to be the unlimited guys and just stay on the unlimited side. And we'll obviously don't want to be abusive, but want to also allow customers not to feel that pain point. So. We've kept the pricing simple. I think we're going to continue to keep it simple, but that's something that we're still continuing to be talking about. Uh, last couple of questions here. Back in August of 2019, according to Ahrefs, you ran a pretty aggressive paid campaign. You were ranking for you know 41 to 50 sort of keywords. You then abruptly sort of turned that off. What happened with that test? Uh, it was just a matter of August. Did you say August 2019? Yeah, August of 2019. And Ahrefs is sometimes wrong, by the way, so that you maybe weren't running any ads, but it's showing that you ran a bunch of ads in August of 2019. So about a year ago. I think I kicked off a bunch of ads. Maybe that's what it is. I think right. I kicked them off and started running them at that point. So uh, that's when like we, in you know, August, September is when we started making a lot of shifts in the company. So we probably pulled down a ton of ads, relaunched a bunch of stuff. We also relaunched it with a new site. Uh, so that's probably what it is, is like our last site came up right around August of 2019, roughly. So if that's when we put up the new site, it's probably when we added new Google SEM search, new Facebook ads, and did a lot of new advertising, just refresh side. T touch on SEO for a second, because you've got a great domain rank of 71. How have you grown your, your domain authority? Yeah, uh, complete content marketing focus, uh, really high quality content. Uh, really focusing on just getting uh, great content in the world and then kind of have our little content engine where we're, you know, 
uh, advertising out with all our content, getting more people into it and kind of putting them through our flow and funnel as well too. So one of our biggest strategies that we really changed was instead of going out and trying to advertise the product or advertise the demo, we started advertising content, really high value, good content, actionable. And basically we were able to drive our cost for acquisition down by almost three X. So we were able to reduce that by really focusing on the content side and letting the content speak for itself. So Can you name one of those pieces of content that sort of does really well for you that you run ads to? Yeah, uh, the newest one that we, uh, one of the newer ones, I mean, the big book of funnels, for example, is one of the ones that we have, or the, the you know, the definitive guide to abandoned cart, uh, the segmentation book that we just released. So we're, we're releasing a lot of these very core focus, actionable uh, books that we're putting out there. And then essentially what it's doing is we're driving leads at about two, three dollars a lead. That's what we're pulling up leads at. And then from there, we're getting about one in 10 as a sales qualified lead. And then uh, naturally, we're bringing one in 10 of those people, uh, 10% of those people are actually signing up for a trial to over over the 30 day period. And then we're naturally converting about eight and a half percent of those people. Super interesting. Yeah, I'm on the Send Lane resources page, Big Book of Funnels. It's basically a nice cover, makes you really curious. And then ask for first name, last name, email, current size. And are you in the market to buy a new email marketing tool? And you're saying you pay two to three bucks to get a new opt in here. And then right. if you get 10 of those, so you pay 20 bucks to get 10, one of them will convert into a qualified lead. And that helps fuel your sales reps demos. Correct. Fascinating. Jimmy, you're doing all that. You're, you're running all kinds of tests, man. This is great. <laughs> Well, you know, I've always been the data guy, so I've been just like drilling into data and trying to figure out how to make better decisions for the company always with it. So where what where would you put your sort of overall weighted CAC right now to get a new $250 a month account? You're going to pay what? Yeah. So, you know, the numbers don't make sense because our team has been lean and we don't spend a lot of money. So like last month or two months ago was the last time I really been, our CAC was 254 on a 250. So they don't okay. make sense right now. So uh, at this point, because we didn't have a sales team, we didn't have a marketing team. As of July, we had one person in marketing and me. So now we have three people. We're obviously out there hiring a VP of uh, marketing now. So we're getting to a point where we're going to start growing that. And I know our CAC is going to go up a lot. So, yeah. yeah. What are you comfortable though in terms of payback period? You'll go up to what? Twelve months? About eight months. Eight, eight months. Is, eight months is my goal. Is my mindset of goal like max? I want to go to eight month payback. All right, Jimmy. Let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one favorite business book. Ooh, that's that's changed a lot lately. Um, Crossing the chasm has been my face, favorite book lately because that's what I just did in 2019 until now. Yeah, it's a good one. So you sort of considered going from sort of two million to five million. That was really your crossing the chasm moment. Well, it was switching complete verticals, launching a new platform, saying goodbye to old customers and also saying hello to new customers. So yeah. a little bit more even than that. So and number finding two, new product market fit. Number two, Jimmy, is there a founder that you're really following or studying right now? Uh, I can't say that I'm following anybody like very, very closely right now. Um, I would say that I would look at my mentor as my like my coach mentor. I work with this guy named Brett Fox. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but uh, he's a big core contributor, but he's been coaching me and helping me all year. So I would look at him as someone I'm looking up to currently right now. Number three, besides your own, what's your favorite online tool for building the company? Uh, right now, it's OmniGraffle right now. I don't know. Omni if what? OmniGraffle. Graffle. I haven't heard of them. Yeah, it's a mind map tool. Basically allows you to build out your mind maps around flows and everything that you need to do. Number four, Jimmy, how many hours of sleep are you getting every night? Six. Okay. And situation, we know you have two kids married. Yep. Married, two kids. And how old are you? Uh, I am 39 now. 39. Last question. What's something you wish you knew when you were 20? Uh, focus. Stop, <laughs> focus on one thing and stop trying to do 900 other things. I think that's been my biggest learning lesson right now is just if you focus on one thing. Not I'm not talking about just focusing on business, but even taking the business and focusing on one vertical or one niche and really being focused on it would have been a lifesaver and difference in the businesses that I've grown. Guys, SendLane.com has just passed $5 million in annual revenue. You heard it here first, up 3x from November of 2017 in terms of run rate. The big change, they went focused. They hyper-focused now on e-commerce sites and the email market needs of e-commerce brands. Average customers paying $255 per month, serving over 1650 customers. They raised some capital to do it. 38 people on the team so far just now scaling up their sales team to see if they can get some repeatable process there to drive additional MRR growth. Jimmy, thanks for taking us to the top. Thank you for having me. One more thing before you go. We have a brand new show every Thursday at 1 p.m. Central. It's called Shark Tank for SaaS. We call it Deal or Bust. One founder comes on, three hungry buyers, they try and do a deal live and the founder shares back-end dashboards, their expenses, their revenue, 
ARPU, CAC, LTV, you name it, they share it. And the buyers try and make a deal live. It is fun to watch every Thursday, 1 p.m. Central. Additionally, remember, these recorded founder interviews go live. We release them here on YouTube every day at 2 p.m. Central. To make sure you don't miss any of that, make sure you click the subscribe button below here on YouTube, the big red button, and then click the little bell notification to make sure you get notifications when we do go live. I wouldn't want you to miss breaking news in the SaaS world, whether it's an acquisition, a big fundraise, a big big sale, a big profitability statement, or something else. I don't want you to miss it. Additionally, if you want to take this conversation deeper and further, we have by far the largest private Slack community for B2B SaaS founders. You want to get in there. We've probably talked about your tool if you're running a company or your firm if you're investing. You can go in there and quickly search and see what people are saying. Sign up for that at nathanlacka.com forward slash slack. In the meantime, I'm hanging out with you here on YouTube. I'll be in the comments for the next 30 minutes. Feel free to let me know what you thought about this episode. And if you enjoyed it, click the thumbs up. We get a lot of haters that are mad at how aggressive I am on these shows, but I do it so that we can all learn. We have to counter those people. We got to push them away. Click the thumbs up below to counter them and know that I appreciate your guys' support. All right. I'll be in the comments. See ya.